Welcome back to the Invest in Yourself podcast. Today I got a very exclusive guest on the show. He was a member of Whitey Bulger's Winter Hill Gang. His name is Sean Scott Hicks. Not very many former members of this gang are sharing their stories. We discuss Sean's life as a criminal on the street. Sean shares his thoughts on former members of the Winter Hill Gang. Sean also talks about spending over 24 years of his life in prison and never becoming a government informant. He's got quite the redemption story, and he's new to this whole podcast interview and scene. So please sit back and enjoy this interview and share it with anyone that you think will enjoy this type of content. Also, please be sure to subscribe to my channel for more exclusive interviews like this. And without further Further ado, let's get into Sean's story. Hey, Sean, how you doing, man? Good, and yourself? Oh, I'm pretty good, man. I'm, I've been looking forward to this interview, man. Thank you so much for coming on tonight. Thank you for having me, man. Yeah, well, I, uh, I came across your, uh, you know, your videos that you were doing. You did a couple interviews with uh, the out there that have been out there. I suppose you've only done a few from what I've seen, but, uh, you know, you got a really good redemption story, and that's what I was really interested in, you know, I cover a lot of those. And so, you know, I really wanted to get into uh, to your story yourself, man. I think uh, the best way to go into it is about talk, going into your early life. So what was that like growing up? Chaotic. <laughs> so that's yeah. the way to put it. <laughs> yeah, like that was, uh, was uh, I was, uh, you know, I don't like to, my mom had her issues the same as we all do. Um, and uh, I wish it could have been different, but it wasn't. You know? mm -hmm. But uh, it uh, unfortunately, I was born into a, a family of uh, Irish mobsters, and I just kind of generational thing, man. And I just kind of followed that path. So, I mean, for you, I mean, when did you start seeing that kind of stuff? At what age? I mean, just right out of the womb, kind of thing. <sighs> yeah, it started. It was almost like a, a Bronx Tale type thing, you know, uh, being taken around. Uh, from the age of like nine, ten years old, so to uh, Uncle Toby's house. Everybody's an uncle when you're when you're Irish. So uh, <laughs> we were doing, uh, you know, Uncle Toby had a like a basement, a split split level ranch or something um, out in the South Shore, outside of Boston, and um, downstairs was fixed up like a social club, and um, everybody hung out there in and out all day. Um, he handled uh, a lot of the uh, fencing, um, so. On the side of his house, there was a big two-bay garage built. Um, trucks would back up to it all day, and just boxes and such would just be unloaded into the garage, and then they would be dispersed from there. You know, so I was I was you know on there mostly as a child. You know, really just was with my dad because my dad and Toby had grown up. Uh, they were born in the Depression. My my pop, who adopted me at birth and raised me. Um, Jewish gentleman named Henry Simons, Hammer and Hank, they called him. Um, he owned the construction end of the company, but uh, there was always an excuse every day. I never knew why. I'm like, oh, oh, it was fun for me to go by and hang out at Uncle Toby's house because, you know, his wife Kitty would bring down sandwiches and lunch for everybody. And, you know, guys would play cards and smoke their cigars. And, you know, it was okay. Yeah. You know, well, you know, for your the, the people that you were around in particular were the the Winter Hill gang, wasn't it? That was straight off the bat when you were the, – these were the, you know, all your uncles, per se, that were, you know, grooming you to be a part of that life, right? Yes. Um, so with Whitey Bulger, he had uh, – he was very Machiavellian, very – he had a South Boston crew. And then over the bridge, what we call over the bridge in the Ponset River, mm -hmm. he had a South Shore crew. And um, – and then he had another crew. There's like three three different boxes, I call them now, <laughs> as a boulder. Yeah. And he never let them intermingle, per no. se, because then he would have to share the profits between everybody. Hmm. So he uh, he lived in Quincy. His girlfriend, Catherine, lived in Quincy. He would go over the bridge to Southie to, the, to Rotary Liquors or to Triple O's. And he had, uh, in that crew, there was uh, Kevin Weeks, Stephen Flemmy, a few other guys. Red Shea, Red Shea's an awesome guy. Um, uh, Pat and he's an awesome guy. You know, they never, they never turned rat. Um, there's nothing bad you can say about those guys. I myself never turned rat. I just did my time, 24 years, nine months. Um, and so Jim would come in the evenings across the bridge and collect, you know, whatever he had to. But yeah, they were around. Stephen was with them a lot of times down in, on the South Shore, but they were two, you know, 
two peas in a pod, so to say. Yeah. So, I mean, with your, what, what was your blood relation to the Winter Hill gang? Um, Did you so, have one? Yeah. So, to my knowledge, um, Howie Winter's brother um, had an affair with my mother, but um, he wasn't involved in organized crime. He was very respected. Nice family, church going, you know, every Sunday. And I was the um, the bastard that was kept in the closet. And I didn't even know um, anything until I was about 15, I think. Um, until one day, uh, it was said, you know, it's time for him to figure out who he is. That was it. And what was that? What did they mean by that? Um, just started doing a lot of stuff, learning how to shoot and um used to go up uh upstate maine um at 16 i was bought uh my first commercial fishing vessel um and then i was bought another boat after i learned that but before that prior to that um i was taken out on boats with uncle bill and uncle jim not whitey another uncle jim oh. uh, learned how to uh run commercial fishing vessels and i think i ended up with uh, four boats all together hmm. So you yeah. had all kinds of boats then that they're yeah yeah they were, yeah so I mean with uh you know with you being you know trained and groomed into this kind of life uh, I mean did you know you're being groomed to you know be a part of you know this this gang yeah yeah it, it didn't take long to catch on because you don't you know you you ride around with these guys and uh, you are fully aware by that, that age, 15, 16. And I'm, you know, at Uncle Joe's, it was called Ace Auto in uh, the south end of uh, Roxbury Old, by the old incinerator, which is now, I think it's a prison. I think they built a, a prison there. Uh, but anyways, you know, it's uh, started uh, put up uh, with a um, clipping cars, stolen car ring. And back then it was just, we were all under 18. So we were juveniles. So yeah. you slap on the wrist if we got caught. So um, Joe Simpson had a, a junkyard, Ace Auto. Actually, there was two of them, one in Quincy over the bridge and then one in Boston. And um, we would steal, uh, back then they had a lockbox, a little black lockbox. The keys, the keys to the vehicles, because there was no push buttons back then. They would be right inside the lockbox and just shatter the window and then bust the box open with a hammer, a mallet, you know, put the keys in the ignition and we would drive them back over to the Ace Auto. And they'd, they had uh, what we used to call the shop monkeys that would pull the tires off, pull off starters, alternators, um, take out radios, whatever. Uh, we were instructed to take um, bigger vehicles, um, Cadillacs, Lincolns, anything that had a lot of weight to it. Um, they would puncture the gas tank take a forklift, pick it up, put it in the crusher, crush brand new cars, put them on flatbeds and ship them up to Canada for scrap weight. Damn. So, I mean, it was just really a big chop shop operation. It was a chop shop, but it was also a legitimate junkyard. Oh, so, I mean, it went hand in hand with each other then. Yeah. Yeah. So with that, then I, I suppose that was like your early encounters with or your early operations that you were involved with. And then with, uh, you know, Whitey Bulger and everyone else that was a part of that, Winter Hill Gang, what was, I mean, what was your perception of them? Did they come off as, you know, scary guys or anything like that? Um, No, no, uh, absolutely not. Um, I just, for the lack of love that uh, I received from my mom, um, the attention I got from them, um, I kind of craved it after a while. I thought it was really cool that, you know, it's, uh, they called me the kid or Shano or, and I'm like, oh, they give me responsibilities. And then there was a, a guy uh, called the Whale that used to run the chop shop. But um, the other kids, I had a crew, I think about five or six kids, um, because we were all kids. We were only, you know, 15, 16 years old. And he would really be disrespectful to them. Um, we were supposed to get, I think, about like 100 bucks a car or something like that. But he was a degenerate gambler. He had hookers in and out of his office at all hours of the night. And... Um, I used to watch him slap the kids around, you know, he'd hand them 50 bucks, 40 bucks for a car. They're like, we're supposed to get a hundred and you get what I give you. And I, you know, I wasn't um, subjected to that. And I, I finally took it to Joe and Toby and uh, I said, Hey, this guy's a clown. Um, 
why do why one he's disrespectful and he's heavy handed with these with my guys and I don't and I don't appreciate it. And they said, well, you think you can do better? I said, yeah, I, I think I can. And um, that led to uh, an incident uh, late one night in the junkyard where I took a tire iron and beat the guy pretty badly. And they put him in a car and took him to a hospital. And um, I, I never saw him again after that. And then uh, when Joe gave, Joe told me to wait in the office, and uh, he and Toby came back and um, he gave me uh, the whale's key ring. And he said, there's a lot of responsibilities to come come with this before you take it. Do you, you still think you want it? I said, yeah, give me in the ring. So. so you became like the, what was your title, I suppose? I just we were out <laughs> clipping cars and I was paying people what they were promised. Yeah. Yeah. So that was like your first, uh, you know, promotion, I suppose, in, in that in that life. That was the first rung of the corporate ladder. Yeah. That? Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Well. So I mean, I know there's certain things you know we can't go into. So I mean, whatever you can't talk about, you know, we'll, we'll move past. But yeah, I, mean, I literally just got off the phone with my lawyer. He's like, <laughs> well, generally the podcast we've been doing, I get like pre pre approved. We do a pre approved question stuff, but. I told him, I said, this is just like a business thing, dude. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I hear you, man. So, I mean, you know, after you were involved with this, I mean, what, you know, kind of walk through about, you know, what was your next, you know, step into this life? Um, I started collecting money. Um, caught a couple of, uh, as a, I think my first, uh, it was a youthful offender back in the 80s or something. Caught like a 60 or 90 day bid for uh, cracking somebody's head. And then um, it just it, it gradually progressed. You know, it, it was like a proving ground, I guess, for lack of better words. So when with you, I mean, with the operations and stuff, like were you doing your own thing, or you ever giving you kind of orders and you did it, or you had to kick up money or what to the crew? No, I um, to Jim to Whitey, I never, I never kicked up money. Um, I would always get a percentage if I did um, contract work whatever that might have been, but um, kind of did my own thing. You know, I was kind of um, insulated, I guess, is the, for lack of better words, was I just kind of did my own thing. Yeah, and I mean, I mean with him having three crews, I mean, I, that's, uh, and he didn't even want you to interact with any of the other ones. Did you ever no. come, come across them or, you know, talk to them or, you know, how, how did you find out that he had three crews? Or Oh, everybody knew his common knowledge. He had Kevin two weeks, weeks, you know, we all know two weeks took him two weeks to flip. Oh, so that's when all that came out. <laughs> yeah. About so, that. Back in the 90s. Um, and like I said, there was, um, again, total respect for John Red Shea out of Southie, man. Um, he's the author of a book called Rat Bastard. Uh, oh, yeah. Did it, did his, did his, uh, I think he did about 12 years or something. Uh, Pat Nee, stand up guy. Um, there wasn't many Irish guys. Uh, you had Jimmy Flynn, he didn't flip. Um, Billy Banowski, um, actually, when uh, Billy passed away, uh, he and I were in the same prison to, together. And uh, I was in my block. He was in the uh, medical unit at um, Shirley. And uh, my cell cracked one night. And they said, hey, listen, um, they're giving Billy his last rights if you want to come up. And I was like, yeah, man. He was, he was out of it, man. He, he passed away. But uh, I went up into the med, med ward and he passed away. Yeah. Oh, well, with, I mean, so, you know, before all that, you know, happened, you know, I mean, you kind of take it, take us back with, uh, I mean, so how many years were you uh, involved with this, you know, crime and up until, until you got out of prison, really? I mean, uh, the- yeah, until um, I made the decision in 2020 um, to turn my life around. Yeah. So, I mean, you were involved with it up until you went to prison as well. I mean, so you yes. had a long long time on the street as well. I mean, how long were you on the street? So throughout, throughout my own criminal resume, I guess we'll call it <laughs> um, multiple incarcerations of a 37 page uh, criminal record. Um, I think uh, I, I, I've been in prison and got indicted in prison while I was in prison for crimes. Right. Um, so um, I was generally on the street for, I had never made it one year. I think the longest I ever made it was 11 months. And then you'd get booked or you'd get, you know, sent yeah. back to prison or whatever. I was indicted with something else. 
Yeah. So I did, you know, I got out of prison and I was just, you know, unfortunately gung ho and right back at it and didn't take them long to figure out what I was doing. And they picked me up and I'd go back in and out. It was a revolving door. So what do you, what do you think was uh, getting you busted? I mean, what, what, what was your character on the street or, you know, what were you slipping the feds? Just, why, why were they watching you so much? Um, it wasn't the feds. It was the state police, Boston police um, task force then at that time. And, um, I just think that um, I, I, was, I was a fucking cowboy. I didn't give a fuck. I, I just really didn't. I didn't care. I was just a cowboy. Yeah, it's really wild. So, the, I mean, you were just always on their radar, I suppose. Always, yeah. I was always up to something. It didn't matter. So, um, there's everything from attempted murders to bank robberies to extortion to a ton of violence, a lot of larcenies, um, uh, uh, it was uh, traveler's checks back then. They used to have them, traveler's checks. Oh, damn. Yeah, so yeah. just all, any kind of scams they, you know, was. Yeah, we had, um, we had a uh, check cashing place in um, Norfolk Downs. And uh, we got hold of a bunch of traveler's checks. And they were just, I'd go in there every day and cash like $9,999 worth of traveler's checks every day. Oh, because if you hit 10000 then that's when they would alert the, who do they alert? Yeah, you um, well, say if you go to the bank, um, now especially after the Patriot Act after uh 9 11, um, you have to fill out paperwork, yeah. So, I mean, I, I mean, literally, I was, I was hitting this check cashing place every single day, and you know, the owner was in on it, he took his cut, and yeah. uh, I just uh, I came out one day, and freaking detectives and cops and everybody just freaking pounced on me, but uh, I guess I went to the well one too many times there. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, eventually they're going to catch on and you keep going there and stuff. But yeah. what were some other cases that were, you know, you were busted for? Uh, bank robbery. They got me for one of those. What was the situation with that one? Um, there was a gentleman, he's now deceased, uh, William Smith. Um, he had done a 7 to 10 for a bank robbery. Then um, 18 to 30 for an armored car robbery. And he was in his 60s. And... Um, I was asked to let him drive for a bank job. And, I, you know, that was his job, just to drive. I was the one that went in the bank. And, um, he parked pretty close to proximity where I told him to park. And I didn't realize that um, he pulled up just a little too far, about 100 yards too far um, behind a loading dock of a uh, supermarket or something. And there was a camera on the dock and I did not think he would use his own car with oh. his own plates on it. And he did. Yeah, he did. Um, so I did the bank, uh, got away, um, went to a hotel up in uh, Revere beach, um, gave him his cut. And from there I took a cab to the airport and I bounced. And then you've been, so, I mean, with some of these cases you can't talk about, I suppose the ones that you did get busted with and, yeah, I mean, yeah, that, that's kind of how we'll go into it. You know, I usually read the guest's book, you know, so I can have everything laid out. But I know your book comes out here in a couple months. So, you know, uh, well, you I know, just sent you a PDF of the uh, advanced reader's copy. I didn't think about that. Oh, yeah, that would have been good. But, you know, when, once it comes out, I can have you on again. But, uh, <laughs> you, you know, uh, what what is, uh, you know, another case that you, you were busted for? And um, Attempt to murder. Um, it's a shootout. uh Shootout in South Boston with some uh, Irish, uh, I mean, uh, Chinese individuals that had a front uh, seafood company. Um, a couple of people got shot during that. I got away during that. Um, uh, lot, just a lot of violence, a lot of, a lot of assault and batteries, just, you know, money collecting situations. Yeah, well, how did that affect, like, on your, you know, your mental? I mean, how did you feel doing these kind of things? Um it, to me, that's when uh, I became an alcoholic early on. Um, I had to be able to live with myself for my actions. Um, I suppose uh, if you're a psychopath or a sociopath, it doesn't bother you. Um, I see a lot of guys that Italian descent that are all over the Internet right now that say it didn't bother them and blah, blah, blah. But they also, you know, got caught, turned rat, gave everybody up. And uh, in my case, it's, I just did my time, um, and, and it did bother me. It bothered me very much. So yeah. Yeah, I used to drink myself into a stupor every night. 
So it was really affecting you even before you went to prison and everything, man. I mean, yeah, absolutely. So being around all the other guys, I mean, how, how did they seem to handle it in your, you know, the gang, uh, the Winter Hill gang? I mean, did the um, as far as Jim, we just, you know, everybody knew Jim was, uh, he was off. And so was Stevie. Um, to my knowledge, I don't, I don't think Kevin, Kevin Weeks ever killed anybody. He just dug up dead bodies and transplanted them to other holes. Um, uh, he was a bouncer at Triple O's. Um, so he was a violent guy when he was young. Um, but to my knowledge, he didn't kill anybody. So he was kind of like uh, Whitey's chauffeur, lap dog, I guess you could say. With Whitey Bulger, I mean, so you brought him up with him being, you know, the wall. I mean, everybody knows. I mean, everything that he did and all the, you know, heinous, sick stuff. I mean, what uh, what was your thoughts? I mean, did were you really in the loop on what he was doing or what he was, or was he just so secretive about everything? He was very secretive. Um, he, but I mean, everybody knew uh, he was killing people left and right, but he it wasn't something that it was spoken about. Just you know, some people went to meet meet Whitey and you just never saw them again. So it's kind of like you know, you, you kind of know what happened. Yeah, just common knowledge again, like you said. Just you know, you just kind of. Yeah, a lot of a lot of uh, Whitey and Stevens murders aside, um, they were committed early on, um, before my time, and then when I was very young, and then um, aside from you know stuff with the Valhalla back in the eighties. Um, and then unfortunately, um, Steven's stepdaughter who he raised and then ended up sleeping with and murdering. Well, Jim, Jim strangled her to death. It's crazy. Yeah, it is. It really is. And I mean, what's, you know, with you, you know, being around a guy like that, I mean, that had of, you know, had some kind of effect on you. As well, I mean, I, I guess you didn't even really know, though. But no, I was, I was really just doing my own thing. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, working, I did a lot of work for a lot of different people. I traveled a lot. So you weren't always in the, you no. know, the, the area. That no, I wasn't was in. always in New England. No. My daughter Asia, um, who uh, actually I was talking, I did a, a video yesterday. Her and her sister, her older sister Mercedes. Um, you know, I'm very straightforward. Um, I'm very, uh, it's a, I have a lot of regret, um, a lot of nightmares. Um, and uh, most nights I work, like I said, I work about 22 hours a day right now on, the, on the, my business ventures. So uh, I don't know if you guys can see around, but this is my office at home. So I kind of, I usually spend most nights on that couch right there. Hmm. Looks pretty nice, man. Nice setup you got there. Yeah. It works. Yeah, yeah, your office, man. So no, I mean, I would imagine you know it helps staying busy and trying to keep your mind off you know stuff like that and just trying to move forward. So yeah, you know, oh, go ahead. I didn't no, make it. no, I'm just, uh, I'm just, I, I made up my mind um, when I got on 2020. I, I didn't know, I don't know the streets anything. My name's good. I never batter on anybody. I gave you half my life. I don't want anything to do with this anymore. You leave me alone. I'll leave you alone. Well, so, you know, we can get into that. It's like, so with your last big sentence, what was that for? Because you got 24 years, and then after that you left. and you know, uh, Well, no, I didn't do 24 straight. It was always oh, yeah. you know, three here, seven there, five here, a couple here. Um, you could have, uh, you could do multiple indictments. Mm -hmm. And it's up to the judge's discretion whether he runs them concurrent or not, which means you could have – five five-year sentences, which would be 25 years. Mm -hmm. Or he can run them concurrent, which means they all run at the same time, or consecutive, which means do your first five, then start your second five. Oh, okay. Yeah. But you ended up what, – what did you get for this last one then? Um, the last one, the prosecutor wanted the max. Um, judge sentenced me to the max, and then he commuted it immediately. What does that mean? He gave me the max and then he reduced it immediately. Oh, so I mean, what do they do that for? What's the purpose? Uh, I think it was the circumstances of the crime. It was an assault. Oh, I don't know. Pedophile. Oh. 
uh, while you're locked up or when, while no, you're on the street? On the street. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, you know, it was just an assault on, on an individual mm -hmm. like that. And then yeah. you ended up getting how much, so how much time did you eventually get like for that? Like, I think it was uh two and a half, two and a half, two and a half. Oh. Uh, so it would have been seven and a half years or something like that, or 15 years. I, I can't remember how they structured it, the prosecution. So he, he hit me with the max and then he just said, and now I'm going to commute it immediately to one year. Oh, okay. The last sentence was just, that was just a, what I call a, what we call a skid bid. It was, they sent me back for the tune up for a year. A tune up. I think, I, I, think yeah. I did like 10 and a half months on it. Oh, and well, yeah. what, so after you got out, I mean, that's when you're ready just to leave that life behind. And yeah. the Winter Hill gang was still on the street, but it wasn't the same as the guys that you were around. Yeah, I bumped into a few uh, younger guys, uh, 20s and 30s. Well, they were calling themselves that. And I politely asked them, you know, don't do that. That's, um, that's run its course. Call yourself whatever. But the reality is... Uh, the last survivors, which I would say would be Patney and um, even with Red Shea, uh, he was pretty much just uh, with Whitey in South Boston. So he was a straight Whitey crew. Um, but Patney was definitely um awesome guy, gentleman. Um, nothing bad to say about Pat. Nothing but respect for Pat. Um, some of the old regime, it, uh, it's – we my my I think my conversation with the younger guys was I've never done crime with you and I've never done time with you. So go call yourself whatever, but not that. Hmm. What'd they say to that? What were they gonna say? <laughs> they didn't have much to say, huh? Yeah. No. no. So so I mean it's yeah, so after that you just I mean, did you who did you did you have to approach them to leave the gang or who'd you have to approach? I mean, probably the guys you I didn't have to approach anybody. No, you didn't? Yeah, no, I think um, what everybody was looking for was for me to come home and take over and, you know, put the pedal to the metal and bring it back to the glory days. And that's, that wasn't happening. Um, at that time, I my, my children uh, grew up without me, my oldest daughters. And when I went to prison, started when I started going to prison originally, they were in diapers. They were, you know, two years old. Mm -hmm. old. <laughs> yeah, really young. Yeah. I came home, and when I, you know, finally got home, um, they were grown women. You know, my daughter, Asia, who's 26 right now, um, she'll be turning 27 in a few months. She she had her first uh, child, uh, my granddaughter Evelyn, when she was 17. Uh, my daughters were separated. Uh, their mother was a screw up, uh, and uh, they got taken in the the system foster care. And then bounced around and eventually uh, adopted by two separate families and separated. And Asia was the first one to uh, seek me out at 18. And um, now she's three children. Uh, she was just here. This She spends a lot of time with us here. And, uh, <laughs> so you uh, were able to reconnect then? Yes. yes yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that had been, you know, rough, you know, going and being in prison and then getting out. And she's just all grown up, essentially, when you're ready to you know, turn your life around and really make the difference. Yeah. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I just, I have a lot of remorse and I, but I take responsibility for what I did. But again, I'm not going to be the person that says, Oh, I'm a victim of my circumstance, you know, you know, my environment um, or circumstances, or I had to do it. I didn't have to do anything. I could have done anything I wanted. Unfortunately at that young age, um, I just, uh, I like the attention that I didn't get from my mom. Um, and I just rolled with the punches on it. Um, but uh, as things progressed from, you know, it's fun when you're, you know, 15, 16 years old and you're clipping cars every day and you're making, you know, a ton of money. You're making thousands of dollars a week as a teenager. And then when the violence started, that's when it started to really weigh heavy on my, my head, my mind. Yeah, I mean, because it goes from just, you know, fun and games to actually being in, involved with violence and being yeah. and hurt. And yeah, because right. it took me a long time, um, probably right until, right until I got out. In, um, August of 2020, I got out. Yeah, August 17th, 2020, I got out. 
And um, during that brief period, I was back. I it was like, I don't want to say it was a, an epiphany or, or the aha moments, but I really reflected back over my life and took stock of myself and the carnage and the chaos and the pain that I inflicted on people. And you know, finally, I just said, you know, it doesn't matter what it was. There's really no such thing as a victimless crime because, you know, I could have done something to somebody like myself that was a piece of crap, but somebody loved them. Somebody, family member, a child, a wife, mother, a father, who knows? So there's really no such thing as a victimless crime. So there's no justification for that lifestyle. So when did you, uh, when you got out, I mean, what, when, what, what made you want to make this change and, you know, stop being involved with that? Um, I wanted to change my legacy for my family. I wanted to, I, I didn't want to just waste the second half of my life. The first act was over. I screwed that all up. Um, I wanted to, I knew at that point, I'm like, okay, well, I'm not delusional. I mean, I can, I can be a father, but it's more, I'm not a nurturing father because my children are grown now, yeah. but I can be, I can, I could be a grandfather and that's what I'm, you know, focusing on now. And, um, but it's, it's great to have my daughter back in my life. She, she drives me nuts. I came over last night, you know, we did a big, big family dinner. And I looked at her this morning, you know, when she was leaving, I'm like, you didn't even wash the dishes or put them in the dishwasher. She goes, you got to do something. You can't just eat and, and watch TV. I was like, okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it sounds like you really reconnected that, uh, you know, to be joking around and everything and having a good time. That, that's just cool, man, because I'm sure, you know, it definitely had to been, you know, maybe tough at first because, you know, some kids, you know, when they have their parents locked up, they don't want them to, you know, do with them after the fact. Well, what happened was she was told um, she was told that by her adopted family, which I, they picked up the slack where I where I failed. But um, when she found out, I guess she was told uh, growing up that um, they didn't know who her biological father was. Yeah, and they did. And they so they were just lying. Yeah, I guess uh, she, uh, as the story goes, she was putting away I don't know Christmas something or other in the attic. And, Found a shoebox with some newspaper clippings in it, and uh, I was uh, I own a construction company um, as well. Go figure, right? <laughs> Everybody owns a construction company. You never had anything to do with organized crime, <laughs> apparently. Yeah, I guess it's. Uh, I was uh, checking on a job site, um, and there was a young young guy. It was his first day. Um, I just stopped by to check on the crew. And I went up on the staging. And, uh, as soon as I stepped up on the, the ladder that was against the staging, everything went sideways. And next thing you know, I was in the hospital, partially paralyzed for about you know, five, six months. And uh, I was laying in my hospital bed. Here comes this skinny little girl walking in, covered in tattoos, holding a baby. And she was with her adopted mom. And she said, do you know who I am? And I said, I'm assuming you're one of my children. <sighs> You could tell. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. Oh, yeah. And uh, we've uh, been rebuilding our relationship since then. Well, and good. Now, now she's on her third child, Malachi. My grandson, <laughs> he's about nine months old now. But uh, my two-and-a-half-year-old Sarah, she bounces around, and then we have Evelyn. She's the oldest. And um, she's seven. And, uh, yeah. Um, learning. Um, learning. Well, learning. Yeah. I'm sure it's a learning process, man, because, is, you know, I met, a, I met a wonderful, wonderful woman uh, when I got out. And when I got out, I had made my mind up so much where I went to a meeting to tell everybody I'm out. Don't use the name. Uh, I was offered a lot of money. And I turned it down. And, and this is uh, in August, August of uh, 2020. I didn't have a car. I didn't have... I think I had $43 in my pocket <laughs> and I had a friend that I, that I actually was locked up with. And he said, dude, I got a one bedroom apartment and my girl's not going to like it, but you're welcome to the couch till you figure out what you're doing. And I spent a few weeks on his couch and um, my federal attorneys 
reached out to me and, and they said, uh, I didn't even have a cell phone. Actually, they called my friend and I talked to him. They said, you're really serious. You're walking away, aren't you? I said, yep, I sure as fuck am. I've done enough. I have nothing to, and I have nothing to prove to anybody anymore. I've done what I, I had to, done what I had to do. This is all, it's, this is my time now. And, um, they said, all right, here's some money. Here's, here's a phone number. Call this real estate agent. I'm going to put you downtown. Go get yourself a condo. So I went and got myself a condo and a dog. And uh, a few weeks after I uh, moved in, you know, furnished it out and everything, I met my, who's now my wife. And uh, we've been together every day since, huh? Like sometimes when I travel, she's not in the mood to travel with me. But <laughs> most of the time, she travels with me. Um, she goes on tour with me. Uh, I'm sure you're doing a lot of traveling now. You know, making up for lost time. <laughs> yeah, man. It's uh, probably six, seven months a year. Damn. Um, yeah, about six or seven months a year uh, between the music and uh, now the podcasts. Uh, we were just down. I uh, uh, just did James English. I did the Insider. Um, and I did Broken Home. I did Kevin Cooney. Actually, I did Kevin Cooney right in uh, TD Garden, the old Boston Garden. <laughs> so not too far from where you were at before in that area. Yeah, I did a small one. Um, I don't even, it's just a local kid uh, called Devin the Dude, I think. And he asked if uh, he could tape a couple episodes. And, um, we actually uh, just walked around the old the old neighborhood in Southie with the cameras following us. <laughs> Yes, I'm sure it's a lot different, man, you know, from you know, uh, wanting to be secretive, you know, before and now having cameras and shit following me around. I I do not use stereotypical names. I'll just say a lot of gentrification. Oh, I'm sure, yeah, everything's probably, you know. You went, you went from you went from pints of Guinness to, to cafe lattes. <laughs> yeah, all <no, laughs> different area, man. So is it is it unrecognizable at this point, kind of? Oh like, yeah, because uh, we used to we used to walk down Broadway, and uh, you really have to step over drunks lying on the sidewalk because it, they it was cheaper for them and easier for them to steal Listerine out of the, you know, because Listerine is just all alcohol. So um, I mean, they'd be passed out, but they all had good breath though. <laughs> yeah, I guess you can. I guess yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, yeah, there was another situation too I wanted to bring up. Was you know a kid came up to you when you were, you know, you got out of prison too, and that was like kind of life changing for you. You know, he was kind of idolizing um, you. Yeah. So I think that <clears throat> what a lot of these, um, what I'm not going to use de uh, derogatory um, terms on you. Show I mean, James English, he was just like, say whatever the hell you want, I don't give a fuck. And yeah, they don't matter on here either. Man. Oh, okay, so, um, well, we'll just call them what they are former mobsters, now rap bastards, or professional witnesses is the politically correct term because some of them will say, You can't rat on a rat, fuck you. You, you walked into this lifestyle, you knew uh, what the consequences were, you know, you can't reap your benefits, get caught, and then give everybody up. That's just, where's the honor in that? I've always I've always been an honorable guy. Um, not justifying anything I did, because everything I did was was heinous. It was disgusting. And, you know, and I'll live with that, because I am Catholic, and I'll answer for that one day. Um, Yeah, I had, uh, I was taking our dog, Loki, our American Bulldog, who was actually scheduled to be euthanized. And um, I ran down to the shelter, and they're like, no, nah, he's, he's, he's being euthanized this evening. I'm like, they said he's beyond help. Um, he, was, he was bred to fight. He was a few years old. And uh, they had tried to give him, give him four or five chances at being fostered or adopted homes, and he just bit the owners, and they brought him. Some of them brought him back within 24 hours. Jeez. And um, – so I said, well, let me, let me, let me work with them. And they said, no, it's already set in stone. And at that time, um, I, my lawyers had given me a loan to get back on my feet. I made a sizable donation to the shelter and they 
pulled him out with this choke collar out the back and they, they took it off him, the cable off him. And he's growling at me and then he finally calmed down and I went to pet his side and he tore my freaking hand open. <laughs> right I got like, yeah, first day within 10 minutes. Uh, and they said, that's why he's being put to sleep. And one of the, the, the techs there said, you should have looked at him first. He's deaf. I'm like, well, no one told me he was deaf. Now I know he, he doesn't know. Some, something's touching his side. This animal was trained to fight. I said, you have to make eye contact with him. So they got me a towel and I wrapped my hand up. And I said, listen, you already took the money. I'll be back tomorrow morning. So I went back for about a month or two straight and just sat with him for an hour or two every day. Just me and him out in this enclosure and bringing him treats and uh, gaining his trust. Because I saw myself in that dog. Um, just, you know, an animal that just was trained to do something. And I said, well, fuck, we can't throw him away. Fuck it. And if that's the case, you might as well throw me away. Mm -hmm. And um, after a couple months, he was, you know, they were amazed. They were like, he's rolling around. You're touching him. And, and I was like, yeah. So they let me foster him. But I, uh, at this time, I'd already met my, uh, my, who's now my wife, Charlene, um, who's my best friend. Best thing that ever happened to me. And, uh, they let us foster him, but we had to get, uh, I think it was a $100,000 liability insurance policy on him. Damn. Because he bit somebody. Yeah. And, uh, and after about a year, they finally let us adopt him. But, um, yeah, I was walking him one day, and a young kid started screaming my name out right in front of City Hall. I'm looking, and I'm like, okay, at that time, I was smoking cigarettes. But he was calling my name. And I'm like, what the fuck? Too young, can't be more than 16, 17 years old, tops. And I'm like, oh shit, well, maybe, maybe I did something to one of his family members, his dad, his uncle, or older brother, or something. I don't know, you know, something. And he uh, came up to me and he said, Hey, you're, the, you're, you're, Sean, you're Sean Scott Hicks, right? And I was like, Yeah. Do I know you? He's like, Oh man, you like that mobster. You just got out. You, you did all that stuff and shot people and robbed banks and did all this crap. That is so freaking cool, man. I, I was like, I was just dumbfounded. I turned around, I walked back to the condo, and I walked in and Charlene, and I said, told her what happened. I said, I, I, I want to I wanna vomit right now. I feel physically sick. And that kind of really was the final nail in the coffin for me to just really change my legacy. Because I think that um, these young young adolescents now, young adults, think that it's a badge of honor to go to prison and that committing crime is cool. And it's not, there's nothing cool about um, breaking the law. There's nothing cool about hurt. There's definitely nothing cool about hurting another human being. Um, I, if I could take back everything I ever did, I would, I, you know, I cut my arm off to take it back, but I can't, you know, it's like I told, uh, I don't know if you saw James English's podcast, but oh, yeah. Well, like I said, if I rip a fart right now, everybody in the room knows I just, I just ripped a fart. I, I can't stuff it back up my ass. <laughs> when I, yeah, no, you're, you're true. That's, that's true, man. Yeah, I you just, um, I think that um, between a lot of the movies, a lot of TV shows and stuff like that, it glamorizes um, any kind of crime, but most, most notably uh, organized crime. And it's just, uh, it's sad because, you know, it, Today's kids are tomorrow's future. You know, I tell everybody in 100 years, I'm not going to be here. None of this shit's going to matter. The only thing that's going to matter is my contribution to helping change tomorrow. That's, and, you know, it. that's just, you know, so I kind of make it my my daily mission just to do something good for somebody. I don't care who it is. can't help everybody, but, I mean, it's, it's funny. Uh, my wife and I, we... Uh, our son and everybody's funny is uh, because he goes on tour with us and stuff like that. And he's so black, he's purple. He's from Jamaica. But he needed a chance in life and we gave it to him. And he's he's a great kid, man. <laughs> Doesn't have a criminal record, works two full time jobs, 80 hours a week, and then yeah. still does his music and takes his time off when I need him. And but I'm teaching him responsibility and humility. Where he's like, yo, pop. How come I can't go to the studio and make more music? I'm like, you can't count on music. You can't count on music. 
you need to count on work and ethic and values and morals. That's what you need to count on. That's what you need to rest your laurels on. I said, if the music happens, it happens. But you got to have something to fall back on. Because, you know, with uh, especially where his his genre of music, um, hip hop, um, they have shelf lives now, three to five years. That's kind of like the, the uh, unofficial rule. Yeah, you can see that now. I mean, it, it seems like, this, you know, they do trend for a little while, but then they start to. Fade right away. Know, then yeah. what are you going to do? Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's good, though, that you're, uh, you know, putting these, you know, just trying to put something out there positive that's going to help people, whether, you know, I mean, if you were to continue to live that life, what, what benefit would that had on society versus you changing around and speaking your your past? That's that, that's more <sighs> beneficial. It is 100%. Um, I, I garnered a lot of respect when I was in, in my past life. Uh, because I led by example, and I never asked anybody to do something I wouldn't do myself. I didn't sit back with a too tight suit on, chomping on a cigar with a pinky ring on, pointing fingers and giving orders. You know, it was, uh, I, was a, I guess you could say I was a frontline general, led by example. So if it worked, it, if it worked then, it should work now if I lead by example. People see me um, bending over backwards. Um, to become a better family man, a husband, father, grandfather. Um, people see me traveling around, you know, the world, building um, my record company, Mob, uh, Mob Rock Records, <laughs> developing artists from all over the country, um, doing my shows, and I come home. Uh, me and Fat Polly, uh, we do the construction, um, and... Uh, now, obviously, uh, my book's coming out. I was talking into writing that. Uh, I think I got about 16 books. The rest are fiction. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, they wanted, they wanted the autobiography first. Um, we've been doing a lot of filming. Uh, Greg Donis, um, we, uh, we're doing docuseries. Uh, was, I just did, I actually acted in my first movie. Um, did you? Yeah, um, horror movie. Down, uh, we were on, uh, the hell were we? Camden, New Jersey. Damn. Pretty yeah. fun. No, no, fun sucked. Why? <laughs> no. I had a very small scene in it. Oh, yet I sat there for eighteen hours. Damn. Waiting. Yeah, you were just sitting around waiting in the wardrobe and the makeup and the costumes and, and just and just waiting on. And then it was an entire day. You know, I'm just hanging out. You know, sitting <laughs> sitting back with everybody else in the staging area and. And we're over there sitting in the casting trucks. Then we're in the catering tent. And I'm just like, what the fuck, dude, man? <laughs> what the fuck's going on here? Then finally, they're like, here comes somebody with a little walkie-talkie. They're like, Sean, 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 come on. They're ready for you. They're ready for you. Cameras are ready. I was like, fuck, okay. And I'm like, I just sat here 18 hours for fucking what's going to amount to a fucking 45-second fucking clip. Get the fuck out of here. I didn't even get a line. I played a dead guy in a tub that overdosed. Oh my gosh! <laughs> you know, I mean, that's his patience. So I guess that's yeah, you know, that experience, man. yeah, it's just something you do. I mean, it's I'm like, dude, I can't even get the final gasping breath. Not even a, <laughs> and then die. I'm dead already. Come on, no, nothing. <laughs> I'm a dead guy in a tub. So welcome to Hollywood. Yeah, apparently. Yeah. No, there was a uh, you know the famous clip that I've been seeing. You know, <clears throat> going viral was you know the situation where you talked about. You know, your son following you. Um, yeah, you know, to. unfortunately, um, I don't, I won't bad mouth his maternal aunt because my three youngest, uh, she stepped in and what was supposed to happen didn't happen. I had, uh, I had the, their, Mother stripped of her parental rights while I was in maximum security prison because she was no good. Hmm. So instead of the three youngest being lost to the system, like the two oldest were, and separated, the maternal aunt, even though she was young, stepped in and uh, was granting guardianship until I got out of prison. And um, she received money every month to take care of the kids. And then when I got out, that cash grab was uh, too tempting and 
because of my record, um, we actually went through three different judges um, during the course of four years of um, I used to I used to come in from the um, Susa Baranowski Supermax prison for hearings. Sometimes I you know go in and and my lawyer would say, Sean, you don't have to be here. You're not even going to go out in the courtroom. I said, if it has anything to do with my children, I want to be there. You can come back in, in the lockup and tell me what they said. And uh, and you know when you be a transporter like that, I'm getting woken up at four in the morning, taken down on the way. It turns into a 15, 16 hour day. And sometimes I never even went to the courtroom. But when I finally started going to the courtroom, um, the first judge was really cool. Um, unfortunately, he retired partially way part part way through. And um, the second judge refused to let me sit at counsel table with my attorneys. And my attorney, you know, I, I remember Horace at the time, he leaned over, he goes, Sean, have you ever attacked a court officer, a prosecutor, or a judge? I said, no, oh, I'm not stupid. <laughs> no, of course not. <laughs> so the judge said, with his violent past and this and that, you know, I, I, the, the tables are too close to the bench. Okay. So my lawyer, you know, um, said, Your Honor, with all due respect, as soon as this hearing is over, I'm going to file a motion for you to suppress yourself from this case because you're biased already. There's no reason, there's no basis for you to not let our client sit at the table with us. So she, um, it had to go through a board of review of judges and whatever, whatever. Um, she had to uh, recuse herself from the case. And then we had to wait for another judge to be assigned. And this all takes a little while because it's, it's nothing in the court system it works fast. No, no way. So finally, the third judge, at this time I was free now. Um, I had wrapped up my sentence and I was out. Um, and she uh, looked at my record and she said, unfortunately, you know, there's some very troubling stuff on your record um, with no statute of limitations. So just because they don't have enough evidence now, there's no guarantee they're not going to have enough evidence in 10 or 20 years or five years or four years. And these are young children. These are my youngest. And she said, so for that reason alone, I can't in good faith return these children to your custody. And she terminated my parental rights. And once that happened, Chase went off the rails. He went off the rails. Um, there's a lot of stuff, uh, I, you know, I, I had to fight it back the other day. Um, I had a lot of legal stuff and stuff that shows that the aunt really lost control of him. I, I, I won't put that online. It's too personal. Um, messages from his mom pleading with me with stuff with Chase. But anyways, he's uh, running around the streets and um, got involved in something. Um, and or allegedly, allegedly got involved with something, um, was picked up for it, held for it, and um, they uh, didn't have enough evidence, thank God, for whatever they were accusing him. Uh, but I did talk to him, and he just said, Dad, I'm going to be like you. It broke my heart. Yeah, man, I'm, I would imagine, you know, that would be the worst uh, fear for you know, a parent or, a, you know, a father in your case, you know, for your son to get involved with the same things you were doing, you know, bad crimes. and Well, you know, it's it's just my my son, like any of my children, are my heart and soul. Um, and they're victims of my crimes, too. And uh, he's no different than any other kid out there. You know, I'm sure he's running around out there like a renegade, you know. So you know who my dad is. And it's big shoes that I guess to fill. But I'd rather him see me. You know, my wife and I had begged him to come live with us. I said, you go back to school, you do whatever you want to do. Just come live with us. And he said, no, I'm, I'm doing what I want to do like you did. Okay. Um, it's not, it's still a hard pill to swallow. Yeah, I mean, I'm at, 
It's my failure as a father. Well, you know, maybe with uh, what you're doing now, maybe we'll have a, hopefully have an in, some kind of impact on them in the future. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but, you know, at some point, hopefully, you know, what well, you're doing. Yeah, I, I hope so, because, um, you know, I, I don't think what this younger generation understands, these millennials, is, is traditional organized crime is dead. It's done. Everything's being done from China or Russia over a keyboard. It's different. Way different. <laughs> it's way different. You go, if, I, if, I, if I were to walk into a strip club right now and say, hey, listen, man, I'm, you're going to give me six grand a month. They're going hello? Yeah, he just tried to shake me down. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> they, 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 there's no shame in the game anymore. It's not, no. you know, you can't go snatching guys off the side of the street and beat them down and all that crap. They, it's after after what Takashi did, forget it. It's a wrap. <laughs> yeah. So with yeah. So I mean, with that and being said, I mean, that's so I guess that's your main objective is just really trying to fill just change your legacy and um it's part of it. What is your full objective now? I wanna show I wanna show guys that think it's cool. Uh, it's I have a theory, you know, with this uh, interjections with high school kids and all that crap. Okay, that might have worked back 20 years ago. Um, kids are a lot older, a lot faster now. I think that any kind of intervention needs to take place a lot earlier, starting in middle school. Because, you know, by the time they're in high school, it's a wrap. If they're doing drugs, they're doing drugs. If they're committing crimes, selling drugs, and, and you know, doing drugs or selling drugs or having sex or whatever, they're doing it. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it's it's a little late to try and intervene. Mm -hmm. I think that um, any kind of uh, prevention needs to start earlier in the educational system. Yeah, you know, I mean, yeah, you. I think you might be onto something with that because at the, at the high school point now, you know, I mean, I'm I'm 23. So I mean, you know, I I, I, I guess I was fucking twenty three again. <laughs> but no, I mean, I, I I guess you know I I seen through what happened with high school, you know, more people were at. But you're, you're right. I mean, it starts even almost in in middle school, man. Yeah. As soon as you know they're freshmen and stuff, all this different stuff's going on like that, gangs and crime and so you know, like you said, all, all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, for, for you to switch, how how do you approach a middle school though know, about this stuff? Um, very proactive. I'm not going to say heavy-handed, but proactive. Um, I think that. Uh, no, you're 23. Um, you don't see payphones anymore. <laughs> no. You don't see kids on the corner riding their bikes anymore. Right. Where everybody's got their face glued to a screen. And I think that uh, what a lot of these this new generation doesn't realize is there's, it's only two outcomes. Um, you're either going to end up in prison or you're going to end up dead for whatever reason. Um, no. It's just these, I think it's a, it's, it's an epidemic, it's an epidemic in itself. And I just, you know, I, I, I work seven days a week to show people that anything is possible if you put the effort to it. Again, I haven't even been out of prison four years. That's true. And you've already done a lot. Years yet. I, I have a record label. I have a construction company. I own Sean Scott Hicks Productions, which is a production film production company. But it it's just what anything in life is possible. If I can do it in less than four years legally, it's just I took the hustler and the street mentality and applied it to legal business ventures instead of illegal. That's true. I mean, imagine what you could have done your, your whole life. You spent in, you know, in and out of prison, you know, just even on the street. I mean, uh, look what you did in four years. I mean, four years. I mean, if you follow me online, I, you know, you guys, everybody that sees this, man, you know, I'm an open book. Literally, I'm an open book. And you will see world class musicians, world class actors hanging at my house now, man. It, it got to a point where my wife's like, We've outgrown the house because of your friends coming in from all over the all over the world and all over the country just to hang out with you and just just chop it up and work on projects together. And um, I've got probably one of the most famous actors in, sitting in the living room with my cousin right now. He's been hanging out with me 
for the last three weeks, he's living in my guest house now. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Damn. yeah well, uh, I mean, that, that's good in itself. That's a blessing, man, because, but, you know, I had uh, Angelo Moy here for a few weeks. Um, my wife was not happy when he started playing that goddamn saxophone at 6 a.m. <laughs> He's the founder of Fishbone, one of the most iconic ska bands in the world. Um, I've got uh, Rudy Youngblood sitting in the living room right now, this Jaguar Paul, the star of Apocalypto. <laughs> Damn. Um, so, I mean, he's got 30 films under his belt. He's like me. He came from nothing off the reservation and became, you know, world famous. Freaking sat down with Nelson Mandela. I wish I could have done that. I would love to talk about to talk a few things. But, I mean, it's anything. You can make all the excuses in the world. Excuses are like assholes. Everyone's got on and they all fucking stink. Bottom line. If you want something in life and you put the work into it, it's going to happen. It might take a while, but I mean, I, 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 I kind of, when I got out, I had a five-year plan. I said, in five years, I want to do this, I want to do this, I want to do this, I want to do this. And I'm doing it step by step. Set and some I, goals. Yeah, you set goals. You don't set the bar. You don't you don't set un, un, unrealistic goals. Those dreams are danger. But I mean, who would have thought you know, December 2nd and 3rd, we're headlining a freaking music festival at Caesars Palace in Atlantic City. Would you be able to imagine that four years ago? You know what I mean? When Fritt first oh. getting out of prison? No. Oh, no I was way. sleeping on my buddy's couch. No. And he just... had very thin walls, and I was listening to his girlfriend going, why do you have to bring that guy in this house? <laughs> and I'm sitting there going, oh, man. It was, I, was, <laughs> I felt bad for the kid. <laughs> like, oh, man. Yeah, well, look, we, you worked your way up. I mean, so you've done so much thanks since you've been out, so... I you know I mean once that book comes out I mean you're just gonna get more and more exposure I mean it's gonna you know keep I mean we're in December right now December nineteenth so let's see where you're at in a couple months from now yeah a couple months from now I mean even uh, I heard from James English he's over in Dubai right now he was like I didn't expect this I I said neither did I I thought I'd get a couple million views not 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 where we're doing a hundred thousand views an hour that's insane it's ins yeah one it's, insane. It, it's fucking nuts. We knew we didn't expect it. And my agent just called me. He's like, all right, you're closing in on, I don't know, 80 million. I think it was 80 million yesterday. He's like, you're going to hit 100 million by, by Christmas. And I'm like, is that good? He goes, yeah, that's real good. Yeah, that's real good. <laughs> <laughs> just like, whatever, that's great. More. But yeah. um, I mean, we're doing good. I, um, I, I think that uh, we're going to do a follow up show with James English. Um, good idea. Yeah, I think they're going to do it right here at my house. Because um, oh, okay. we're my wife, I left it up to my wife to find the new house, and somehow we ended up with this freaking 6,000 square foot mansion out in the middle of the mountains. <laughs> well, you let her pick it. <laughs> happy wife, happy life. She puts up with freaking all kinds of people just fucking coming in, hanging out with weeks at a time, and I'm like, yeah, we're working on something. Yeah, well, I mean, that, that's awesome, man. She sounds like she's very supportive of, of you and what you got. Um, She comes from a very storied family from Charlestown Projects. <laughs> yeah. Of... Uh, Armored car robbers. That's <laughs> Patrick. <laughs> yeah, so she's been around all that the the stuff that you were involved with. Is it Fitzpatrick or Fitzgerald? I don't know. I think they're both of them. Fitzpatrick, Fitzgerald, the Burhos. Um, her. I guess it's uh. What the fuck is Archie? Anyway, it's her uncle. When I first met her uncle, um, he was in his fucking eighties, <laughs> and he was being um, he was uh, on house arrest at another uncle's house. He had a bracelet on, and he, uh, I don't know, he had done 50, at least 40 or 50 years for armored cars. And damn, I was like, damn, he just got out. And he's like, yeah, now these son of a bitches are trying to, trying to stick me with murder and three cops in the 70s. But they can't find the evidence. I was like, okay, that's probably a good goddamn thing. So finally, that, uh, that went away, and uh, he moved out to Arizona. But he's a funny little bastard. <laughs> I, we were filming a reality show that's in post production right now. We showed up at the cameras. He was looking out the curtains like this. What the fuck is this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it sounds like, uh, you know, he, he's been around a lot of stuff, too. So, I mean, with her being around it, I mean, it, that, it's just all, you know, it, it's good, though. I mean, she can understand the, the background that, you know, you were involved with. and <clears throat> Well, yeah, eventually he let him, he let him, he did an interview and let him film him. Oh, did he? Yeah, after I talked to him for a little bit, he was, he said, all right, you, you come from good stock. 
<laughs> good stock. Yeah, good stock. <laughs> what, what can you say, right? It's old, yeah. older generation. But yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, in all seriousness, um, uh, it's it feels good now. I had a um a young lady, a uh, student that was working on her uh, doctoral thesis, um, from Northeastern University, mm -hmm. and she got a grant, and contacted me and said, I want to write my thesis on you. Wow. On house. Yeah. And uh, she said that somebody with such a violent up, you know, past and such a broken and shattered upbringing as a child could turn their entire life around. And she did. See, I mean, there's lots of people recognizing what yeah. you want to do now. Yeah. I just, again, but it's lead by example. You know, it's uh, if I can do it, anybody can do it. That's it. It's as simple as that. You know, I got out at 49 years old, 52 now. I said, frick it, you know something? I'm going to be a rock star. I'm a rock star. I want to write a book, another book. Um, all right, so I wrote a book. Got a major book deal. Um, then it's just, you know, the floodgates opened. Everybody was like, you know, this and that. And my wife was laughing at me earlier. Uh, she's online because, I'm, thank God, I'm a, one, I'm a one of one on all search engines. She's reading all these celebrity pages, and she's like, "These they don't even do their research, do they? And I was like, no. So they said that her Asia was my and her daughter, which she's her stepmother, but they had a, they had my daughter Asia listed as two years old. Really? Yeah. So they just, whatever, they, they put it yeah, on. Yeah, I think that um, since everything went viral, they're just in a mad dash. Like, I, I think it's yeah. comical. Like my agent, uh, AJ, um, he's uh, located in Florida. My entertainment lawyers and my managers and my business partners out in L.A. Um, they're just like, and even James English, he was like, Sean, he goes, you're getting more positive feedback than negative. He yeah. said, which is, and he said, and you're getting numbers that, that are unheard of. That's he true. Said, he said, you just, you took me from being the U.K.'s biggest podcaster to a global podcaster. Damn, that's insane, man. Yeah. That, that's just that shows how powerful your message is and how it can be. You keep doing interviews, keep doing books and speaking engagements. And yeah, things. that's, that's what they got me going to next. Um, I want to go to, um, any kind of detention centers for you reform schools. Um, and just let these kids know, man, Hey, you haven't crossed the bridge yet because once yeah. you go over the bridge into adult sentences is generally, it's harder to come back. Not saying it's impossible. I'm proof of that. You are. But it, it, it's a lot harder because, you know, during the course of giving up 24 years and nine months of my life, of uh, missing my children growing up um, and coming home to them having children and being grown adults and being shot four times, and stabbed six times. And it's once you cross that bridge, it's hard. It's hard to turn around. There's not as many U turn areas. No. <laughs> So oh. if, you can, if, you can, if you can nip it in the bud, yeah. And if I can, if I can contribute to anything, I have to. It's just, it's like, a, it's a, it's another passion in me. You know, there's nothing fun about getting shot or shooting somebody. There's nothing fun about any of that. There's nothing glamorous about it. Because once you get, once you hear those steel doors start clanging behind you, and it's not just one. There's a bunch. Down, all the way down the hallways, all the way into the block, you know, your, your sally ports, then your cell. And then you're sitting there. You're there. Just you in that cell. No one's doing that time but you. You're doing it day for day. And, you know, unfortunately, I was always in a, like a 23-hour a day situation. <laughs> so I got an hour. I mean, one time I was in a, uh, it was Norfolk State Prison. And it was called the RB, Receiving Building. But that's where they had the whole... And on the roof, they had dog kennels where they used to put the dogs. Mm -hmm. That was our that was our rec area up on the roof in a kennel, dog cage. Oh, oh you would go in there. Yeah, not that's, not, that's, not a dog. Oh no, they didn't put the dogs in there anymore. It was, it was deemed inhumane. Jeez, man. And um, so when I took a shower, it was a cage around a shower head, and I had to take a shower with shackles and handcuffs on. There's nothing, nothing glamorous about that. And um, I just don't think that the 
kids committing crime today, man, realize that. Might be cool when you're on the street and your friends and whatever you're doing. Um, but, they're, you know, you get caught, they're not with you. It's hundred percent true. They're not with you. You're all you're all alone. No, you're you're absolutely right. I think uh, you know, with you this episode, people can really learn, you know, the get in front of the right people. I mean, hopefully someone shares it to someone that they think needs to hear it because there is, you know, a lot of people that watch these shows have family members that are involved with it or kids even, man, grandchildren. I mean, it's it's terrible, but I mean it seems like there's a lot of people with family members impacted, man. Yeah, I mean, when we were we were shooting a, a reality show that's uh, still being edited right now, and I told my daughter, I said, you don't have to take part of this. She goes, I want to take part in this, not to be famous. She goes, there's nothing really unique or special about me. I'm not the only child in the world with an incarcerated parent or a parent that's been incarcerated who grew up in a system. She said, so if I can reach someone in my age demographic in their 20s, I want to. It's personal for her. Yeah, it was really, it was, uh, it was, yeah, it was, it was very gut-wrenching. More gut-wrenching than anything I've done to date. I learned a lot of stuff that happened to my daughter in foster homes. Well, sorry to hear that, man. I mean, that's, uh, you know, yeah. like you said, we just move forward and, you know, you try to be there for him now and that's all you can do. I mean, like, like you said, you can't go back. So, yeah, I mean, it's, um, again, I just hope that, uh, can't save everybody, but if you can save one or two of man, or any percent, a small percentage, it's worth it. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate you coming on, Sean. And, uh, you know, do you got anything else you want to finalize any words, promote anything or, um, yeah, I want to promote, Get an education. Mm -hmm. Don't commit crime. Um, look at what I've done in a short period of time. Um, you know, uh, Mob Rock Records, Test Human, Diamond Cut Drums, production companies, clothing lines. This is one of our clothing lines. PMA, Positive <laughs> Mental Allergy, all day. I like it. Author. Uh, the author, uh, <laughs> husband. Um, but most importantly, a changed man who is trying to be a productive member of society. That's right. Well, thank you for coming on. Sean now got his heart in the right place to want to do better and becoming a better person. If he can change his life around, anyone can. Sean is doing his best to make an impact on at-risk criminals and changing his legacy for the better. Please comment any key takeaways that you got from this interview. Please share it with anyone that you think will enjoy this type of content. Also, please be sure to subscribe to my channel for more videos like this. I got more exclusive shows coming, so please stay tuned. At the end of this video, a playlist will pop up of all my other Mafia-related interviews. I've done in the past. The last thing that I'll bring up is my other podcast that I do. I co-host that with Salvatore Polisi, who was a former member of the Colombo crime family. On that podcast, we cover Sal's life in the mafia. To access that podcast, it's on the same YouTube channel. All you have to do is go to the playlist tab and click a lifetime of mafia tales, and you'll be able to see all of our episodes we've done on there. So thank you again so much for tuning in to another episode, and of course, we'll see you on the next one.